Well, let's talk a little bit now about sea ice. That ice that forms over the surface of the ocean when the seawater cools down to freezing. Sea ice effectively acts like a lid over the top of the ocean. When sea ice is present, it really inhibits or prevents exchanges of energy or anything else between the atmosphere and the ocean. Typically, however, that sea ice is cracked. It has a network of cracks in it that are called leads and also sometimes due to oceanographic conditions, open expanses of water form that are called pollinias. And these leads and pollinias are very interesting biologically because where you have cracks in ice, you have places where light can penetrate, you have places where air-breathing mammals can come up and grab a breath of air, and pollinias even more so. And so leads and pollinias uh, are important biologically, but they're also regions that allow heat exchange between the atmosphere of the ocean and what otherwise would be a completely uh, frozen over uh, part of the ocean that would prevent all exchanges. So the roles of leads and pollinias, of course, are going to be very complex because um, they form at different times and it's kind of hard to tell when they're going to form and how many of them there are, but they add a little bit of complexity to it both biologically as well as physically. Sea ice also reflects solar radiation and this is one of the major concerns of the melting of the Arctic because it exerts a kind of positive feedback, as we'll see in a few moments, that actually with sea ice present, it prevents warming of the water, but when sea ice disappears, the water warms up much faster. In any case, the reflectivity of sea ice in any material is called its albedo, so the percentage of sunlight that's reflected by a surface, whether it's snow or ice or the ocean or a brown patch of earth, that's called albedo. And as it turns out, ice, of course, because it reflects solar radiation very well, has a very high albedo. And you really notice that when you go up skiing. When you're skiing, you notice that how bright it is. You get a suntan both from the sun. If it's a nice day, the suntan from the sky, the sun coming down from the sky above you, but also being reflected back up in your face. You ever wonder why you get so red and sunburned when you're skiing? Because of the high albedo of the snow and ice. Well, here's what sea ice looks like, of course, and you see these leads and see how complicated it is. And this sea ice moves around all the time with the winds and the currents. You can see ice that buckles up and tumbles over each other. And it's really a fascinating type of ocean to be in. I've been fortunate enough to spend uh, a couple, three times up in the Arctic Ocean off Norway, uh, the Barents Sea, the Greenland Sea, where I've encountered sea ice, and I've also been fortunate enough to spend uh, five weeks down in the Weddell Sea in the Antarctic. And you never tire of looking at the landscape or the seascape formed by sea ice. It's always in motion, it's very complex, but it's also a fascinating environment to work in. From Table 8.2, we get some idea of the different albedos or reflectivities of solar radiation. And again, as I said, this is a very important principle uh, with regard to melting of the Arctic and the role that the ice caps play in keeping our planet moderately uh, moderate temperatures. And it also, uh, as we'll talk about in just a minute here, it also exacerbates concerns about the removal of that sea ice and how that can cause even greater heating. But of course, fresh snow and ice has a high albedo, beach sand, a lower albedo, and interestingly enough, even the ocean is not a good reflector, is at least not as good of a reflector as fresh snow, not a good reflector of light. Light penetrates into the ocean instead of being reflected backwards. Well, let's take a little bit of a look, and this is just a, a graph you have to follow through with your finger uh, to get a good idea of what it's talking about, but this is figure 11 in your book. This is what's called the ice albedo positive feedback loop, and it goes something like this. If we have more heating of the Arctic, for example, then we're going to have more open water, and if we have more open water, then we're going to have more absorbed radiation, more absorbed solar radiation, okay? If we have less heating, we're going to have more sea ice, 
and less absorbed solar radiation. Okay, so if we have, of course, more sea ice, it should make sense to you there's going to be less absorbed solar radiation. If we have more sea ice, then there's going to be more absorbed solar radiation. The same thing true with snow cover. Of course, in the same fashion as well, if we have more absorbed solar radiation, then we're going to have greater heat flux into the ocean. If we have less absorbed solar radiation, then we're going to have less heat flux into the ocean. Okay, I think a better way to look at it can be done with penguins. Here we see in this figure a group of frolicking penguins. Of course, penguins only can be found in what continent? That's right, Antarctica. We don't find penguins in the Arctic. However, we do find igloos in the Arctic. So this figure, which I didn't create, but I found it on iStock Photo, um, is a little messed up in that sense. But in any case, as sunlight penetrates th through the atmosphere and hits the surface of the ocean, some of it's going to hit the actual surface of the ocean, some of it's going to be reflected off from the ice cover. As that ice melts, however, less is reflected off and the ocean heats up even more. And if the ocean heats up even more, we're going to have even faster melting of the sea ice. And the ocean's going to heat up even at a faster rate and more penguins will die as a result. Well, that's not really true. They're just doing water acrobatics, okay? So again, if we go back to the beginning, sunlight is reflected off when ice is present but as that ice is removed, either through global warming or natural processes, the ocean heats up more. Of course, then when the ocean heats up more, then the ice melts even faster, and the ice melting even faster lets the ocean heat up even at a faster rate. And when the Arctic becomes ice-free, then the ocean just becomes a sink for heat. And that's the concern. Right now, the Arctic ice caps, as well as the Antarctic ice caps, are reflecting a certain percentage of light that's kind of keeping us in the game, so to speak. But as that ice disappears, and when that ice completely disappears, then our Earth is absorbing all that heat that otherwise would have been reflected away. So it actually tends to accelerate rates of warming when the ice disappears. This is an example of a positive feedback there's nothing positive about it in the sense of its effects for the human race, but a positive feedback tends to accelerate something. A negative feedback tends to keep something within strict boundaries. A thermostat in your home is a form of negative feedback. When the heat gets up to a certain temperature, then the heater shuts off. Or when you, your house cools down to a certain temperature, the air conditioner shuts off. But imagine, if you will, that when the temperature got down to a certain temperature in your house in the nice cool days of summer that your air conditioner moved even faster or imagine if you will in the winter that as your house heats up to a certain temperature that the heater another heater kicked on those are examples of positive feedbacks okay so it's important to know the difference between positive and negative feedbacks because they're really important in um, terms of climate change but also things that go on in your life all right.